Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to all of you joining us from uh, all around the world. Um, Raymond Kerr, I'm the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, welcome to the third and final day of the fifth annual UAE Security Forum. Uh, we have had two days of excellent discussions. Um, on day one, we heard for, in the opening keynote session from Dr. Ahmad al mandari the Regional Director for the Eastern Mediterranean at the World Health Organization. And we continued a deep dive into the healthcare challenges in the region with an excellent panel of distinguished experts. Yesterday, we looked at uh, the role that education and innovation play in helping to build long-term economic resilience and ensure the success of major economic transformations that are critical to the Gulf countries' long-term prosperity. Today, we revisit a recurring theme here at AGSIW and look at the challenges of climate change, uh, food security, and the prospects for a green recovery in the Gulf Arab countries. And we have another stellar panel of experts joining us who I will introduce very briefly, and then I will share their full bios and a chat function with, with all of you. Uh, first joining us from Dubai is Tarifa Zabi, the Acting Director General at the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture. Uh, from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, our very good friend Aisha Sarifi, a research associate at the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, and non-resident fellow uh, with us at AGSIW. Uh, Dr. Mark Tester, co-founder of Red Sea Farms and associate director of the Center for Desert Agriculture at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, where he is also a professor of bioscience. Um, Eckhard Wirtz is the uh, director of uh, the Institute for Middle East Studies at the German Institute of Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, Germany. He is also professor for contemporary Middle East history at the University of Hamburg and a non-resident senior research associate at the Barcelona Center for International Affairs. Moderating the session is my colleague Emma Souprier, a visiting scholar at AGSIW. I should mention that Emma has just published a paper on a very similar topic to this year's forum which argues uh, to bring the human security aspect front and center in the debates on Gulf security. I will share a link to that paper shortly in the chat function as well. Before we start, I'd like to remind you all that this webinar is being held on the record. Uh, it is being recorded and will be made available on, your, on our website tomorrow. Uh, our audience is in listen only mode, but you will be able to uh, uh, ask your questions through the Q&A function and Zoom. Uh, and with that, Emma, over to you. Thank you so much, Raymond. It is a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us in this webinar and thanks to everybody watching us at home. I hope you are all staying safe and well. In 2020, the coronavirus pandemic has come as a reminder of the urgent need to increase the focus on human security questions. It appears in fact crucial to bring the human dimension front and center in the deb debates on Gulf security, not only because it encompasses critical challenges for the populations themselves, but also because these increasing sources of human insecurity threaten some of the premises that underpin the polities of the Gulf states, particularly their rent high political economy. Looking at the detail of these issues is thus paramount to better prepare the way forward and come up with innov innovative solutions to address them. Our esteemed panelists today have dedicated their work to these topics, in particular food security as well as climate related challenges. And without further ado, I will turn to you to tell us more about your views and assessments of the situation. So to start with you, Akit, um, I was wondering, could you tell us what are the main challenges that the Gulf countries have faced amid the coronavirus pandemic when it comes to food security? And what do you identify as the most pressing issues to address there? Well, in the beginning of the crisis, there were uh, some concerns about uh, disruption of food supply chains globally, but also in the Gulf. Uh, especially for those supply chains that rely heavily on labor, where people can contract the disease, for example, in, in the meat packaging industries, where there were a lot of cases where uh, uh, less so in, in, in large scale agriculture, let's say wheat production. Um, but at the end of the day, um, nothing has really happened. Food availability was assured, not only in the Gulf, but also in other parts of the world. So we didn't have these kind of supply side uh, uh, concerns 
uh, uh, as we had uh, 10 years ago during the global food crisis. Um, and the UAE in particular also had like a task force in play that place uh, that was able to source alternative supplies in case there was some hiccup somewhere along uh, uh, supply chains. And also the UAE as a small country uh, um, has much more possibilities in that realm than large countries that, that cannot as easily rely on imports. Having said that, I think the main issue as always uh, with food security is not really availability. We have lots of it uh, uh, and actually we eat too much of it, uh, um, especially in the Gulf, uh, um, but also in other OECD, in OECD countries. Uh, but food accessibility, right? And I think uh, what the COVID crisis maybe has highlighted that even in a situation of relative abundance, there are vulnerable segments uh, of the population who uh, suffer in terms of food security, not because there is not, uh, not enough food, but because they do not have the money to buy it. Uh, and also, of course, during the economic crisis uh, that COVID has caused, we have seen in the Gulf, uh, uh, of course, the blue collar workforce suffering quite uh, uh, substantially. And that quite uh, that some of these issues that have existed in the labor sector in the Gulf region before, for example, regarding labor rights and uh, sometimes non-payment or late payment of wages, weighed considerable uh, uh, on the food security of these people. Um, I, so we'll, we'll come back to, to some of the, the topics that you've raised here and thank you so much for your answer. I will turn now to Aisha. Uh, similarly, I was wondering if you could tell us what you identify as the main challenges for Gulf countries when it comes this time to energy security and climate change. And how has 2020 shown a new light on these topics? Well, thank you very much, Emma. And a uh, uh, pleasure uh, to be uh, on this panel today. Um, I think there are three segments uh, on your question. Uh, I think the first segment is uh, uh, the challenge of the energy security in the Gulf. And then maybe we can look at the, how it is interlinked to the climate change. And the third one is how the the COVID-19 or 2020 has shown a light on those topics. Well, uh, speaking about the energy security, um, so for the Gulf Arab states, although like it is in Doan with the high oil and gas reserves, uh, where there are nearly a third of all uh, reserves and it has uh, nearly a fifth of global gas reserves, uh, the energy security is, uh, is, uh, is an issue for, for the Gulf region. Um, uh, the domestic energy consumption uh, has, uh, has been increasing uh, uh, for almost six times since 1980s. And the annual uh, growth of the energy demand is uh, almost 5% on average. Um, so there are many factors that uh, contribute to this increase in the energy demand uh, in the region. These, uh, of course, include the population growth, uh, the high standards of living, um, also uh, the low prices of the uh, energy provisions, uh, uh, like uh, low prices of water, electricity, and uh, transportation fuel. Also, uh, there is a, a general expansion in the industry, um, uh, as well as the economic diversification uh, processes which are also putting uh, a, a pressure on the energy uh, demand because, you know, like most of the economic diversification processes uh, are focused on moving uh, down, uh, down, downstream uh, in terms of the hydrocarbon sector uh, because the, the, the focus is to maximize the value of the hydrocarbons domestically uh, uh, through expansion, you know, like uh, the refineries, um, uh, petrochemical industry and, and, and so on. And so those are actually like, even the economic diversification process itself, it's putting pressure on the, the energy demand. Uh, another challenge is uh, we, we are here in a region uh, with a hot climate generally. Uh, uh, the, there is a, uh, already uh, issues with the water shortages. Um, and so there is an increasing demand for cooling and for uh, 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 supplying the water um, and water desalination 
is uh, actually at the moment is providing around 50 to 100 percent of all water supply in the region. And these processes uh, of the cooling and, and then uh, water desalination, these are uh, energy intensive processes. Uh, now the cooling uh, account for almost, um, let me, uh, for almost 60 to 80% uh, of household electricity consumption here in the region. Now, uh, when it comes to the climate change, Yes, climate change is putting uh, an extra burden uh, uh, in the region uh, when it comes to the energy security, because uh, climate change um, uh, climate change is uh, actually contributing to increasing the average temperature in the region, and uh, climate models show that, for example, Qatar has uh, uh, the, the average temperature in Qatar has already increased above two degrees Celsius. And all uh, uh, goes for the water, uh, for the water uh, supplies. So, because also uh, climate change is exacerbating uh, the or, or elongating the periods uh, periods of drought, and then uh, you know uh, uh, limiting uh, the the seasons of the rainfall. Uh, so the, there are this actually putting extra pressure on in, in the region, which is already. Uh, suffering from water shortages. And so climate change is um, driving further needs for cooling and for water desalination uh, in the region. Now, uh, as weather 2020 have shed uh, a new light on those uh, issues, uh, well, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic actually uh, uh, is actually has been good news uh, for countries, not only in the Gulf, but also globally when it comes to the climate change and the energy security issues. So, um, so uh, colleagues here at, at CAPSARC, where I'm speaking at the moment, have conducted uh, uh, different analysis, uh, looking at different aspects on how the COVID-19 uh, has affected different matters like the energy demand or the CO2, CO2 emissions in the region. Uh, uh, one of the studies um, uh, showed that um, the, 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 the demand for, for, uh, for, for the uh, gasoline and for the fuel in general has a decline uh, because of the, uh, the, the countermeasures has been taken by uh, the governments here, uh, especially during the, the, the lockdown uh, period. Uh, for example, there was a closure of schools, university, public spaces. Uh, there is also an implementation of remote working policies and that have led to dramatic decline in you know, the transportation, uh, whether it's private or public. Um, as well as a, a dramatic decline in, in, in for the people to go and fly. So uh, there was a, a decline in, for example, electricity use, uh, um, uh, except, you know, for, for the households. Uh, but I think uh, one of the studies showed that even for the households, they, they, there was a, a little bit of decline in the electricity use. Um, in terms of the carbon emissions or in terms of the climate change, uh, also the lockdown measures also have been good news on that front. Uh, we have seen uh, almost a 7% decline in the CO2 emissions at the global level compared to the 2019 uh, emission levels. Uh, for the Gulf region, there is a study has been conducted by a colleague uh, of mine here. Um, who shown uh, in their paper that there was a 4% decline in the CO2 emissions in Saudi Arabia in 2020 compared to uh, 2019. And that, that's also due to the COVID-19. Also, um, uh, also in, in, uh, uh, in the air quality uh, uh, front, uh, there is uh, data from Mohammed uh, and Rashid Space Center showed a 30% decline of the nitrogen uh, dioxide emissions across uh, the GCC. Uh, uh, and that is mainly because of the restrictions that has been imposed on the transportation sector. Now, uh, 
both the decline in the energy demand and the decline in the greenhouse gas emissions, these are considered good news um, uh, for, for the environment. Uh, however, however, they, they have happened at uh, a high uh, economic cost. So what 2020 has shown us, it has shown us that uh, uh, these two aspirations of uh, tackling the climate change and tackling the energy security issues, these can be achieved in a collective manner. However, like if we don't uh, implement the right measures in the right time, the decline in the energy demand and the carbon emissions can happen at the high cost, uh, uh, such as uh, the, the the, the impact of the COVID-19 that we have seen. Um, so I think with that, um, I don't wanna like, I don't really like, I, I think I highlighted a lot on the um, uh, negative aspects uh, of the, uh, you know, there is a looming uh, issue of the energy security in the region, the climate change is there. Uh, but I don't want to sound, uh, you know, like alarming and the, uh, showing that the, the governments in the Gulf here are not aware of those issues. They are aware of those issues and there are many efforts that have been done to address those issues. Um, maybe you can speak about those later on and expand on them further. Thank you so much, Aisha. Yes, um, you brought up a, a lot of excellent points and uh, thank you so much for this response. And, and you're right, we're, we're gonna get to the, the policies aspect uh, of it a, a little bit later. I think uh, one important point that you underlined is how much 2020 has shown that not when there's a will, there's a way, but when there's a necessity, there's a way. And, uh, and it, it has been quite incredible to see how countries have been forced to, to take emergency measures that have proven to be pretty positive when it comes to the challenges coming with uh, climate change. So thank you uh, so much. And to uh, tie together maybe what Eckert was uh, underlining earlier and, and what you just underlined, Aisha, um, Despite the way, I, I think it was very important, uh, the point that you made, Eckert, about the fact that when it comes to food security, the main problem is not availability, but accessibility. Uh, regardless, uh, a lot of the Gulf countries have, are trying to address those, those questions of, of food security through uh, notably agriculture. And so I will, I will uh, turn to Mark here. Um, you lead a research program at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology on how plants can thrive in suboptimal conditions. So I was wondering if you could talk to us more about the project and about how your company Red Sea Farms helps tackling these issues. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, the opportunity to talk. This is a pretty important forum. I like it. Um, the, 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 we do have enough food production on the planet, that's true, at least in terms of calories. Um, but we do need to um, improve the amount of, um, of nutritious food. So the world's biggest health problem isn't COVID-19, it's uh, or even tuberculosis, um, but it's uh, micronutrient deficiencies and uh, you know iron deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, and we do need to improve the, the quality, you know, <laughs> the quality of food in terms of the nutritional value. So there's definitely enough calories to go around. In fact, we're already producing enough calories for the projected population for 2050 uh, by some analyses, especially if people who are eating too much don't eat as much. Um, but we do need to have more nutrition. And uh, that really requires more fresh fruit and vegetables in particular. And that requires more local production, if at all possible, because the grains can ship around and it's a commodity that's relatively very easily moved um, and traded and managed. But um, fresh fruit and vegetables is another matter. And I think the COVID-19 crisis has I think, sharpened people's attention to um, the benefits of trying to have local production for fresh fruit and vegetables. I think it's completely right at the food sector as a whole really held up incredibly well um, in during this crisis it's amazingly resilient um, at least in developed countries but uh, yeah if we can try to um, improve 
local production of fresh fruit and vegetables, that would be good. And that's where some of my research is heading. I've been working on, in particular, uh, the ability of some plants to grow on saline soils. Uh, you go down to the beach, they're different plants, to just 100 metres away from the beach. Uh, so how do those plants do it and what's missing from the plants that can't do it? And then can we use um, the, the, the skills of the plants down on the beach to... Um, to improve our ability to grow plants on low quality water, because it's all very well to talk about fresh fruit and vegetables in, um, in the Middle East, but water is by far and away the biggest um, limiting factor, obviously, in this region. In fact, globally, I mean, arguably the food sector has the highest environmental footprint of any sector of human activity. I mean, no energy sectors, <laughs> You could say because of the massive CO2 emissions from the energy sector, but the food sector is second or third in the energy emissions in particular, greenhouse gas emissions, in particular methane emissions from rice paddies and from um, ruminants. And uh, we have food sector occupies half the land that humans use, and that hasn't been increasing for the past decade. It suggests to me that we're pretty much maxed out and the amount of uh, land that we can use for agriculture economically viably, at least using current technologies. And the third thing that the food sector demands is water. So globally, two thirds to three quarters of all the fresh water that humans use is for the food sector. And in this region, it's nearer 85%. Um, and it's crazy. And anything we can do to try to reduce the water footprint of our fresh fruit and vegetable production in particular, I think can lead to quite significant um, contributions to food security, which can be brought into security um, in, in this region. And uh, yeah, I mean, a bag of tomatoes, kilogram bag of tomatoes, that's like four tomatoes in a little bag that takes 350 litres of water to produce in this region. And uh, for me, in the long term, the only option for long term sustainable food production, fresh fruit and vegetable production, is uh, to grow in covered environments, in controlled environments, where we can protect the plants from the heat and massively reduce the water footprint of the, um, of the food, the fresh fruit and vegetables that's being produced. So when you put a grow tomatoes in a normal commercial greenhouse that you can click and buy from the Netherlands. Uh, if you're using evaporative cooling, the water footprint's pretty similar, which is pretty horrifying. And 90% or more of that water that's used for the production of those tomatoes is just to cool the greenhouse. So you make huge savings in the irrigation uh, demands of those plants, but you, it almost perfectly balances with a massive increase in the water um, for cooling, required for cooling the greenhouse. Um, alternatively, you can use mechanical cooling, you know, like a lot of the air conditioners that are using, what did Aisha say, 60% of the energy in this region. So you can do that, and you're doing that in a glass box with the sun pounding in, it's insane. But you can do that, you save a lot of water, but you use a huge amount of energy. So we need to break this food, water, energy nexus that we're trapped in. And so my work is the work that we're delivering through my company, Red Sea Farms, that I co-founded, is to substitute as much of the fresh water used for food production with salt water. And what we can do in a greenhouse where we're producing tomatoes, for example, or other fresh fruit and vegetables, is it's actually relatively simple. We can use seawater or other salty water, water that we currently do not use and cannot use, we can use that water for cooling the greenhouse. And that often comes with a challenge because where the seawater is, there's often high humidity. So we've had to invent um, technologies to enable us to cool with that high humidity. So we pre-dehumidify the air using a liquid desiccant. So overall now we're building a package of technologies to try to increase the sustainability, reduce the environmental footprint of, um, of our food production. So now our bag of tomatoes in our saltwater cooled greenhouse with solar glass and all these other things, the water footprints now, it's, it's about 20, 20 to 30 litres, depends on scale and humidity and all sorts of things, but roughly 20 to 30 litres instead of 350 litres for your bag of tomatoes. So that's quite a, quite a big 
um, contribution to reducing water and energy savings because we're re replacing that fresh water with salt water and having, in fact, we're using less um, electricity, less uh, fossil fuel derived energy in our greenhouses. So I think that's quite an important contribution. So we're really trying to roll this out and really scale it up in uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much, Mark. That is uh, fascinating. And uh, it, what it made me think of also is the, the whole, the assessment of Gulf countries when it comes to having to choose, well, what, what could be locally produced in terms of assessing the, the balance between um, virtual water and water consumed in the, in the countries. This, um... Thank you. Thank you. Could you just triggered something just quickly. Um, one thing is that to do this, it's all very well for a starry-eyed academic to sit in his university and talk about this. What we really want to do is be pragmatic about the water savings, be pragmatic about the technologies we actually deliver. So we might not save 100% of the water, but we save 90% of the water. And that leads to relatively small impacts on the capex. We're reducing the opex. And so it's still a business. So, you know, you can talk about environmental sustainability. That's no use if you can't commodify it or monetize it in some way. So we have to turn this into a business as well. And that's part of the point of us moving our research into or delivering our research through a company. And we're putting our money where our mouth is and demonstrating that we can actually have a profitable business from that type of technology. So it's, 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 it's economically sustainable as well. Thank you so much. And uh, Tarifa, I will turn to you. Thank you for being patient. You are the Deputy Director General of the International Center for Biosol and Agriculture. And I was wondering if you could precisely t talk to us more about the mission and the objectives of the center and how it helps address uh, these challenges that we've been talking about. Thank you, Emma. And uh, again, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I was um, patiently waiting for my turn to speak because I mean, I'm seeing and I'm hearing keywords that I would like to compliment because it's exactly what we do. Um, again, we're speaking about ICBA, the International Center for Biosaline, which is it's exactly what Mark Dister has been talking about, is the biosalinity and what we can do and it provides solutions for it. Yet our motto is agriculture for tomorrow. So we are merging both where we can, promoting for the sustainability and through applied research and finding uh, applied solutions. Again, uh, theories are everywhere. It's very important to ensure that our research are applied and pr pragmatic in a way that it is showing us the added value. So who we are, we are a center that has been established in 1999 by a generous contribution of UAE, United Arab Emirates government and the Islamic Development Bank. So we were founded in 99 as a non-for-profit applied uh, research center specialized in innovation in agriculture. And the biosalinity is what makes us unique in terms of finding a solution. Our headquarter is located in UAE, yet we do have one regional office in uh, Uzbekistan, uh, representing Central Asia, um, uh, Central Asia region. So what do we really do? Uh, the center focus on um, improving food security and nutrition. And again, it's something very important. It's not about the how many food we can produce for people, how nutritious this food could be for people, and how sustainable this could be for them in the future. And we focus on the water security and environmental sustainability. And not only that, because we have to look at the entire cycle where we look at the socioeconomic factors as well. So therefore, we are also interested in creating jobs and livelihoods in marginal environments. Our key focus is really marginal environments. Again, marginal environments include um, Gulf countries, include the different parts of the world where it has uh, uh, you know, difficulty growing different type of uh, crops and plants due to the climate change, due to the type of soil, due to the uh, uh, scarcity of water, which is very important that we don't only depend on the fresh water when it comes to growing agriculture and ensuring that we have alternative, uh, uh, alternative options uh, for that. 
Uh, we also look at different solutions using technologies where we can um, pr uh, predict and look at the early uh, uh, drought, uh, drought uh, monitoring system. We looked at uh, how can we really involve the drones in finding solution, whether for seeding or even building salinity, creating salinity maps where we can really look at the perfect and right slot for us to uh, you know, conduct the uh, farming. Uh, we look at the um, uh, out-of-the-box solutions. Again, if we want to grow uh, vegetable and fruits and ensure that it is really sustainable throughout the year, then we need to go for the protected um, agricultural type where we have them in an environment that they can survive or we modify the environment, environment for them so it becomes suitable for them um, to grow. The question is that we usually get asked is why again marginal environment? And I'll give you some facts regarding marginal environments. Marginal environments are places that suffer from the biophysical dimensions, which we have 20, 21%, which is 2.74 billion hectare of those lands resources uh, are marginal. Some 1.128 billion hectare are affected by salinity globally. So it is really a global challenge. It is something that is growing and something that the countries will be suffering from. And therefore, we have to think of the future and think of how can we really find solution where we can really um, uh, work, work with it. The social the dimensional aspect of it is around 1.75 billion people live in marginal uh, regions. And the thing is some Again, marginal environment countries are wealthy, so they can really have um, the ability to invest in creative solutions. Uh, yet the challenge is with some countries who are really financially uh, struggling, and I would say the income per individuals is quite low, which it even makes it more difficult for those individuals um, to live in these areas. More than 820 million are undernourished people who live in marginal environments. And that's why we need to look at the quality of the production and look at what we can really offer in terms of um, the crops that we, we share. So what do we do? Uh, the scientists we have, we work with the group of experts and scientists where they can really find all the, create all the applied research to find solutions through, uh, uh, you know, um, investigating what could be best done, whether in terms of saving water or finding alternative ways of water. I mean, uh, Asha mentioned earlier that, uh, again, and it's known to all, that uh, Gulf uh, countries, we rely on uh, desalinated water. But what happens with the rejected water from desalination? Because that itself is a challenge by itself. And it's even something that we really look at and try to see how can we really make value of that? And how can we really utilize that rather than uh, it's being put back in the sea where it's also impact the marine life and it could really uh, cause us another crisis uh, in the future or even increase the salinity of the soil if it's really kept in the land. Um, again, our team look at the technicality or would they would also consider the economical factors and we look at the social impact uh, for all of that. And we do, our, we do uh, specialize in areas where we can tailor made solutions of the, um, uh, solution for the problems related to salinity and water scarcity. And we try to uh, ensure that the knowledge is there. So we work with the policymakers to ensure that um, uh, uh, intervention is already happening at a higher level. And if we have uh, come up with the solutions that will enable the countries uh, to run their uh, food security or of, uh, agriculture in a better way. Uh, we will make sure that of our in the table. We work with the small hold farmers, which is very important. Again, during COVID, uh, they are the people who've been hardly hit by COVID because they didn't have access uh, to their farms. They couldn't have access to the, uh, to the market and therefore they have been really uh, um, you know, impacted uh, greatly. Uh, another thing is we try to look at the integrated agri aquaculture system again, where we look at the uh, rejected uh, water from desalination. We use it uh, to grow holophytic products, the products that love salt and can really 
live in the salinity and we use the fresh water to grow the vegetables. So again, we care for every drop and we ensure that there is no waste uh, happening and maximize the usage of that. Uh, as long as we look as an alternative resources and alternative solutions, we can address the same problem and uh, the same way and we expect similar solution. So the idea is we try to become creative where we can look at a different way of sol solving the issue in order to ensure that we have um, different results. One of the things is what we are trying to do and we work, the center has been working on is introducing these crops which are uh, uh, salt uh, tolerant. Uh, one of the thing is was the uh, quinoa. And again, we've worked in different countries where we worked with Morocco and Egypt and uh, Jordan, uh, uh, and even farmers in UAE where they can adopt uh, quinoa and they try to use it as a very high smart crop is what we call it. It's uh, very, very high in nutrition. And, and again, it's something that will add value to the food basket. Shall we teach them how they eat it as well? Because again, every time you go and you introduce a foreign crop uh, to people, sometimes it gets rejected. So again, working together with farmers and working together to come up with solution, uh, again, applied research, nothing better than applied research to prove to them that it is really the solution and it's very important. For the sake of sustainability, we focus also on sustainable development goals, so we can really contribute to the 2030 uh, objectives uh, when it comes to that, as well as we do have identified certain areas of research, of which is management of natural resources and marginal environment, which is again working with unconventional sources of water to grow um, uh, our crops. We look at the climate change modeling and adaptation while we are trying to focusing in technology. And we also try to look at the crop improvement and sustainable production by introducing new crops. One of the things that's even we've been uh, uh, working on it as a project, which is the siliconia, and how can we really ensure that people adopt to siliconia. Siliconia is a halophatic uh, uh, crop and it, it loves salt and it can grow in the uh, sea level, uh, sea, uh, sea water. And th therefore people, we work with different chefs to teach people what we can, uh, what can they do with it? Either they use it for salting or they use it for food. So uh, I myself tried it as, as a siliconia burger and it was very good. So again, at the beginning, it was like, no, I'm not going there. But later on, when I tried it again, people need to trust the process and they need to try it in order to get engaged. Last but not least, we also do the integrated agri aqua culture system, as I mentioned earlier, we ensure that there is a, a merge between the, um, uh, the salt water and building a system that can um, feed into the crops, uh, holophytic uh, crops. Uh, so that's, that's, that's us. And uh, again, we combine most of what uh, everyone has mentioned. And um, I hope that was um, in a brief uh, of, of what we have been uh, doing in, in Iqbal. Thank you so much, Tarifa. That was extremely interesting. And uh, I, it, it is really fascinating to see how uh, the, the, different, the different parts of, of answering these uh, challenges, both locally and, uh, and so we've been looking at the, the local response. And I think it's quite fascinating to see how everything is tied together. I would uh, I would like to, to move to more social, political aspects of uh, addressing these challenges. We heard uh, notably from, from Aisha about the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the economies, um, and, and, uh, but also from Eckert about the crucial challenges posed by uh, inequalities in terms of access to food, because the food is available, it's uh, the, the accessibility that is a problem. Both of which raise the question of the economic model, model of the Gulf countries. Uh, and Mark and Tarifa, you have talked about the promises of new technologies and implementing also new businesses to address these difficult human security challenges locally. So um, I, I will open a, 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 um, a few questions about the way forward. To stay with you first, Tarifa, um, I know that prior to joining the ICBA, um, 
you have worked on strategies to motivate uh, young people through innovation and research and training. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell us more about this work and your findings and how this could help to tackle the current challenges in this uh, possible evolution of the economic model. Well, when, uh, when I um, joined ICBA, everybody told me you're moving from students to plant. That was a big shift. And again, I mean, the secret is just both of them need care and nurture in order to ensure that you get the good result that you want. So youth, again, is part of the formula. What we do is if we are talking about agriculture for tomorrow, we own the prison now and we are trying to create all the foundation for the future, for the better future, hopefully, of agriculture. So they're going to lead the future of agriculture. They've got to know the know-how. Before even the know-how, they've got to understand the challenges. They've got to understand their environment. They're not, they've got to understand how can they really contribute to that, whether it is on a social level where youth can really be responsible for their own action or through direct engagement of research and development. So what ICBA does is we created a, play, a platform for youth to be engaged and to be working closely with scientists as uh, interns, as postdocs, as, as visiting um, uh, scientists, so they can really learn. And we even start from a very young age. We do have the Emirates Soil Museum, which is a perfect place where they can, again, experience everything. So we ensure that the experiential learning, a pragmatic learning is already happening. And all those youth, you know, they touch it, they feel it, they see it, and they believe it in order to see the result of what they do. Another thing, we also uh, launched something called, uh, we launched something called ICBA Youth Engagement Society. So we started opening chapters in university about marginal environments. So we educate them about marginal environment, the needs of it, how can they really contribute to it? They don't really have to be agricultural specialists in order to contribute to that. They might be engineers, they might be uh, graphic designers. So we welcome really different, it's just about the mindset, how can we really bring them and make them responsible in order to make sure that they really contribute and we can really guide them and have the know-how. And then we go for the category again of women empowerment. And again, it's one of the SDGs and we focus pretty much seriously on women, women empowerment. Globally, so many women own farms. However, they haven't been empowered enough through the farming uh, process they make. So we provide capacity development, uh, whether it's technical or whether it's on uh, developing the know-how and the skills. So we launched ICBA launched uh, a program called Aula, uh, and Aula is the Arab women leaders, uh, Arab women leaders in agriculture. And this program, we have graduated 22 women from Middle East and North Africa, and we celebrated their graduation on the 8th of March, which is International Women's Day, to ensure that we really make a, a, a remarkable change in the life of women, scientific women and researcher in, 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 uh, in agriculture. Uh, uh, again, one of the research that uh, has been conducted here in the UAE, uh, uh, in, in 141 farms, they found that the farmers are 41 years plus. Uh, I'm not saying they're old. I'm not saying 41 and plus is old, but what I'm saying is we need, <laughs> we need more younger people joining as well and ensure there is the sustainability. Globally as well, you will find youth leaving their, um, uh, you know, leaving, leaving the countryside and they're going to the cities looking for employment. So why not working with them in order to promote for agripreneurship and ensure that we are creating them? It's different when we teach them the skill and it becomes a business that they brings them financial sustainability as well as the food security at the same time. Thank you so much. Um, I think what the points that you raised about really um, increasing the awareness, especially of the youth, of the issues themselves is, is 
absolutely crucial uh, locally. And then as, as you were pointing out, there's also the question of how to implement those new models, how to get the, the youth uh, involved in, in the way forward. Um, and how do you make sure that younger populations uh, well, get involved in say farming or agri-tech or agriculture related new businesses? And uh, in, in, this, um, in this regard, I, I wanted to turn back to you, Mark, because um, one issue that is often pointed to is uh, a certain disconnect and that tied to, to what we were talking about, a certain disconnect in Gulf countries between the skill sets of, of, uh, of Gulf nationals, in, including uh, the youth and the requirements of uh, development plans and labor markets. And so I was wondering, building on your experience, what do you see as uh, viable options to help change this? How, it, how important is it to help create a local skilled workforce despite the success of Gulf countries to attract skilled men and women power from all over the world? Yeah, I mean, uh, the bottom line is that uh, we need agriculture to be sexy. You know, it's got to be... Um, very uh, innovative. It needs to be uh, using some of the latest things that interest people and interest people in this region. But the challenges here are enormous, but the opportunities as well are there. Education, these activities that ICBA do, just fantastic and exactly right. And I think I'm very positive because we have a lot of opportunities to address these big challenges in food security uh, through innovation. And we have uh, technologies, we have um, biotechnologies, of course, and genomics in particular can really accelerate crop improvement um, programs. And that's good. Um, the other technology, um, of course, which can make a huge impact, and I think is highly relevant immediately in this region are digital technologies. And so we can make vast improvements using you know, IoT principles, you know, sensors everywhere, controllers, AI to interpret the massive stream of data that IoT systems can deliver and uh, make learn to make intelligent and strategic decisions for the management of um, the environment and um, of the plants in that environment. So I admit I'm coming mainly from a context of controlled environment agriculture because I seriously think that is the best opportunity, especially in this region for intensification, sustainable intensification of agriculture. But this can be massively improved in its efficiencies um, in terms of reducing inputs and increasing outputs through IoT, wireless sensors. Uh, the, the, the technologies are beautiful. And why I think they're particularly good for this region is because I see young people in this region really engaging with computers with digital technologies um, and people can really do a lot of things that are highly impactful for the food sector uh, from their laptop in their air-conditioned room you know and and this <laughs> this is a big advantage <laughs> and I think that's highly attractive to um, to, um, uh, to, to to the youth in this sector I, I held a hackathon when I was I was actually head of the food sector at neon for 12 months and uh, wrote the strategic plan. And during that time, I held one, um, in collaboration with Kaos, held one um, hackathon here at Kaos. I just came out so optimistic. There were, I don't know, 200 young people smashing into problems and doing incredible things and producing apps to work out how, when to feed the fish in a fish tank. You, know, you give them a, a fish tank and a few other issues and, um, and a bit of hardware and in a weekend, these people were doing fantastic things. So I think um, digital technologies are really very, very important for making serious impacts in this region over this coming um, five, 10 years. So yeah, I'm optimistic. I do think we can do good things here. Yeah. Thank That's you so much. Um... Duly noted, dig digital technologies um, have are full of promises, and we do need to make agriculture sexy uh, to to make it part of uh, the the economic diversification to address uh, those 
human security challenges across the board. And here in terms of uh, talking about economic diversification in, in light of uh, human security challenges, I would, I would like to turn to you, Aisha. You have worked uh, extensively in the political economy of envir environmental sustainability and climate policies. And I was wondering, do you see the climate related as well as energy security issues as a window of opportunity for Gulf leaders to, to leaders to drive diversification policies further and faster? And uh, what obstacles uh, would need to be overcome both at uh, the individual levels? We, we talked a little bit about the individual level already, uh, but also in terms of gov at the government level. Sure, thank you very much, Emma, uh, for this good question. Um, yeah, I think uh, a short answer is yes, certainly. Uh, I see there is a window of opportunity. Um, and so with, for me, like with the challenges comes, uh, you know, uh, opportunities. Um, uh, but to expand further and before speaking about, you know, the, the obstacles that the individuals and the governments should overcome uh, to, uh, you know, uh, achieve energy security and tackle climate change at the same time. Uh, I, I would like to highlight on, on the opportunities and here I'm trying to reflect on a paper uh, that uh, uh, it has been already drafted and it's about to publish uh, soon. So, um, so the COVID-19, uh, uh, actually what COVID-19 has done for, for the Gulf region, as, an, uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, it has reduced the domestic demand uh, uh, for, for the energy, but it has also reduced the demand for the energy at the global level. And uh, for, for the Gulf countries that relies, you know, on oil export revenues uh, uh, heavily, uh, it has translated negatively to the Gulf economies. Uh, so uh, this unprecedented global decline in oil demand and the, histo uh, the historical decline in the oil prices is actually a, a reminder on how important it is for the Gulf countries to have diversified economies that do not depend on one commodity and are more resilient uh, to external shocks. Uh, from a climate change perspective, and this is what, uh, an area that I specialize in, uh, COVID-19 also has uh, brought uh, to us a snapshot on what the economic impact uh, could look like uh, if the future demand of the energy uh, uh, declines due to the advancement in global climate action. Now, uh, there are, uh, Although uh, the, the demand uh, to the, uh, the oil and gas uh, uh, hasn't been declining because you know, of the global climate action at the moment, because uh, the global climate action is gonna take time for the transition to happen and uh, the, the consequences of it uh, to materialize. But uh, I would like to highlight a little bit about the pledges that the countries have taken. So actually the number of countries that are setting carbon neutral targets is increasing. The countries that are putting carbon emission cut targets are increasing. Uh, for example, uh, last week and during the Climate Ambition uh, Summit, which has taken place virtually, uh, and uh, it was replacing the, the conference of the party, the 26th conference of the party that has been delayed uh, due to the COVID-19. Um, the, the countries that account, a number of countries that account for 60% of global uh, CO2 emissions, and they account for 70% of global economy, they, they have raised their climate ambitions and announce pledges that can reduce their dependence on the fossil fuel. So for example, the UK has announced that it will stop financing overseas fossil fuel projects. Uh, others has aimed to uh, you know, produce 100% of their energy from renewable energy resources. The Gulf trade partners um, uh, like the EU, uh, Japan, uh, China, and India they also have announced pledges to factor green investments in their recovery packages and accommodate net zero emission targets. Um, 
Now, all of those like pledges and ambitions and, 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 and you know, the concrete action to achieve those aspirations, this could translate into reducing future demand for the GCC uh, uh, oil. And now, uh, also like going back to, to the point, uh, where do I see a, a window of opportunity here? Certainly, uh, we like reflecting also from uh, our paper, there we argue that uh, while tackling the economic harm caused by the coronavirus pandemic and, uh, 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 and also protecting the human health uh, should be a, a, a top priority for the governments uh, at the moment as they tackle the issue of the COVID-19 and during the time of financial uh, crisis. Uh, we argue that also associate, associating the COVID-19 economic recovery packages with measures that aim uh, at safeguarding the environment and addressing the climate change or so-called the green recovery, this, is, uh, this should also be equally important. And that is because, um, because you know, the Gulf countries already have in place uh, environmental uh, and climate related uh, uh, projects, but these are not in scale yet. Uh, and having uh, those uh, you know, uh, initiatives like the renewable energy, energy efficiency, carbon capture and storage, nuclear, uh, and most recently, uh, uh, because the Saudi Arabia has uh, you know, chaired the G20 this year, and I was part of the, uh, the T20 this year, uh, has adopted the circular carbon economy as a way to uh, uh, protect, uh, reducing uh, or mitigating the, the, uh, the CO2 emissions. Uh, if we uh, uh, actually put those investments into scale, then that is going to be not only beneficial for the environment, but also for the economy. It will ensure long-term resilience and sustainability of the GCC economies. So, for example, um, uh, the investments uh, in you know renewable energy and the energy efficiency is actually going to help uh, uh, the GCC economies in two ways. In one way, it's going to help in creating a, a new economic sector. Uh, it's going to uh, you know uh, help with the employment as it's going to create jobs uh, along uh, the value chain. And as colleague mentions, uh, we have uh, the, the youth here who are looking for jobs. So uh, this is an area where we can support uh, the youth. Um, and it's also uh, uh, investing in the renewables or the clean energy now, but not later. It would help us also to uh, accelerate or do the, inner, uh, the economic diversification process in a clean way. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, most of the economic diversification processes are focused on expanding the downstream uh, industries in the hydrocarbon sector. So uh, uh, putting the, the clean energy you know, in, in those uh, downstream uh, uh, industries would help to ensure that these industries are run in a clean way where the carbon emissions are minimized. Um, and this is, uh, these are some of the opportunities that I can highlight on. But uh, moving to the, the, the obstacles on uh, how to do that uh, from both a government and individual level. So at the government level, um, well, again, um, here in the Gulf countries, there are many uh, climate and environmental related initiatives. There are renewable energy targets. There are energy efficiency programs. Uh, but I think my concern in, in this area um, and why we don't see uh, those uh, you know, uh, investments in scale is uh, we, we, and perhaps this is not only also for the Gulf region, but it's also globally. So we do have you know, targets, but then the regulations, the incentives uh, uh, that are needed to achieve those targets are not like really um, uh, have been you know, uh, put uh, uh, in place uh, uh, and are not there in detail. Um, 
So, for example, there is a need for in incentives, for financial incentives for the in investors to get engaged uh, in, the, uh, in the market. Um, uh, it shouldn't just be to have a target out there and then, you, you know, we don't have enough regulations that guide the investor or the financial incentives that guide the investors uh, to get involved. Um, I would also like to say that uh, uh, the, the Gulf countries should uh, not only focus on the large scale of projects uh, when it comes to the clean energy and the energy transition, but they also should um, uh, also encourage the small scale projects like, for example, uh, the encouragement of uh, installation of rooftop solar panels. And uh, another important point, uh, uh, when it comes to the climate change, uh, the risks and the opportunities that are associated with it, uh, we should also, uh, uh, here in the region, we shouldn't treat the climate-related issues and the sustainability issues in isolation with the economic development efforts. The, these two efforts should be uh, uh, really aligned with each other uh, uh, and not look at uh, in a separate manner uh, so that we can ensure long-term sustainability and resilience for the economies uh, and reduce the future impacts of the climate change uh, in the region. In the individual level, uh, a few points I would highlight on. I echo uh, uh, the, 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 the point that Mark and Tarifa has uh, pointed out to the importance of supporting the youth uh, and, and the education uh, in, in, uh, in achieving uh, uh, many uh, sustainability uh, uh, aspirations here in the region, uh, in, uh, whether it is food security, energy security, or uh, promoting for the energy um, uh, uh, energy uh, uh, transition. Um, so for me, I think uh, the talented youth are here in the region. Uh, uh, they they are also uh, looking for jobs here. Uh, they they the talent is there, but maybe they they need more of the support. We need to create the right incentive. Uh, incentives for the youth to get engaged in the uh, energy transition. Um, uh, and I think, uh, as Tarifa has mentioned, it is really important uh, to educate. Uh, and uh, from climate change and, and energy transition perspective, I think it's really important to integrate the knowledge of the climate change and energy transition in the education system. Uh, and most importantly, make the, uh, make the students ready to go into the market. And that's, that can be done not only through uh, educating the students theories about you know, uh, and science about the climate change, but also uh, 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 give them the, the skills to be entrepreneurs uh, so they can get ready to go into the market, not only uh, uh, through the uh, school level, but uh, I mean the, the university level, but also starting from the school level. And, um, and um, yeah, I mean, um, also, um, one last point I would highlight on, I think uh, here in the Gulf, the, the prices of uh, the energy provision has also been one of the factors that delayed, um, you know, the energy transition and for the people to look for the alternatives. But we have seen here some uh, the, the, the recent uh, price reforms that have taken place uh, here in the region, like in the UAE and the Saudi Arabia. They, I, they are actually have been approved to help in changing the people behavior in terms of the energy consumption. And, uh, and it, it really encouraged the people to look for alternatives here in Saudi Arabia and also through a study that have been done by colleagues here in Capsarc. They showed that the uh, energy efficiency programs that have been implemented here, they really help helped uh, to, uh, you know, uh, raise the awareness of the people on uh, how much they ener energy they consume. And it also encouraged them to look for uh, uh, appliances that are more energy efficient, uh, efficient so they can reduce the electricity bill and uh, they can uh, increase their energy efficiency. Um, I think I will 
I strong, I'm sorry, I just have to cut in. I so strongly agree with that last point. Subsidies are so distorting and so inhibitory of the adoption of innovations. I think the electricity subsidies still need to go further, personally, because it's still cheap. And water, you need to remove, people have to pay the real price for water as well. Then we really will start innovating and adopting innovations. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Absolutely. I mean, you're most welcome to jump in. And uh, I think it is, it is an extremely important point indeed. How much, uh, how much more, uh, how, what, what, what uh, government could do more to actually push for those in, in edu uh, energy transitions? And on this point, actually, I would like to, to uh, go back to you, Akit. Thank you so much for having been patient. Also, um, I, I know that you also extensively covered the political economy of energy issues, looking notably at the geopolitics of renewable energy transitions in the broader MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region. And so I was wondering if you had, um, if you could tell us more about your findings and how the Gulf relates, uh, compares to other other parts of uh, the the Middle East, maybe in terms of energy transitions, and um, what are your what is your assessment, and uh, what are your comments on on this topic? Yeah, maybe let me go briefly go back to this food security issue because there are connections with the energy issue. Eighty five percent of the food in the Gulf countries is imported. And all the technological tricks uh, and, and the technology that is out there that, have, uh, we, that we have discussed will not change that. Huh? The, even if you manage to go to 83%, yeah, with a lot of uh, new t technological gadgets and so on, you will be still the region that is most dependent on food imports in the world. And you will rather go to 90% than 83%, even with new technologies because of population growth. And mind you, uh, uh, it, more efficient use of water doesn't mean you use less water. Yeah? If you use these efficiency gains for production increases, has happened, for example, in Morocco, the introduction of drip irrigation has led to increased water consumption. So technology is not the silver bullet for food availability in the region. The food will continue to come from imported food. Yeah? So the Gulf countries, in a way, need to be worried more about drought in Russia and North America and Brazil and Australia than drought in the Gulf itself. Because the food is coming from these countries. And they need to worry about the sustainability of exportable surpluses in these exported nations when we talk about climate change, for example. And, and now it comes to the energy side. They need to have the money to pay for it. And they have the money to pay for it right now, so everything is fine. Yeah? But might that change? It can change basically on three levels. One thing is that production is decreasing. Yeah? A very real prospect in countries like Yemen, for example, or, uh, or Syria, and not only because of conflict, but because of aging fields. Not in the Gulf countries so far, yeah? mostly. Or that prices uh, are declining, or, or that your domestic demand is skyrocketing, and Aisha has pointed uh, that out. And that's actually a huge issue uh, uh, in the Gulf countries. And actually, there is a, 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 a potential case for complementarity of uh, uh, increasing renewable energy consumption at home in order to free uh, uh, oil or, or, or keep your oil export uh, uh, capacity. Having said that, uh, uh, there is a third, of course, uh, uh, impact that maybe global demand is plateauing or even decreasing, which would affect prices and your ability uh, uh, to achieve oil revenues and essentially pay for your food imports. And I think in that sense, uh, uh, if I may play the uh, devil's advocate, renewable energy transitions might be actually bad for Gulf food security in the sense that it might compromise the ability to import food. Yeah. Some markets will be affected like gasoline and diesel, especially if you should have uh, a, a strong electrification of the transportation sector and possibly uh, uh, also of um, heavy transportation, ships and trucks. For example, Germany has this green hydrogen plan and with hydrogen, you, you could also power uh, 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 more, more, more powerful engines than just the car. Huh? So some uh, uh, sectors of uh, the, 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 the petroleum products market will be affected over a period of 20, 30 years or maybe 10 years already. Um, and that will have implications on prices. I think, again, some Gulf countries are well 
position to cater to those petroleum products markets that will uh, continue to grow like petrochemicals. Yeah? The UAE, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, they've invested in petrochemicals. So that's a sector of the market that will continue to grow. Even a Tesla, right, might not need gasoline, but imagine how many plastic parts are in a, a, a car nowadays. So I think that is really something uh, Gulf countries need to take uh, uh, into consideration. I think they have now a window of opportunity for diversification, as Aisha has mentioned. They have a window of opportunity, like let's say 10, 20, maximum, absolute maximum 30 years, rather 20 years, uh, uh, to, to, to kind of calibrate uh, their energy mix and, and how, they, how renewable energies will interact with, with uh, uh, hydrocarbons and might safeguard some export capacity. But overall, of course, uh, these renewable energy transitions are potentially bad news for the Gulf countries. Because this vision that uh, the former oil minister uh, uh, Al Naimi of Saudi Arabia once outlined that the Gulf countries might be able to export electricity produced from renewable energies in the futures instead of oil, that will not happen for two reasons. First of all, it doesn't make sense to transport electricity over thousands of kilometers because of transmission losses. And secondly, the sunlight is much more evenly distributed than oil in the world. It does not have the same scarcity value. It doesn't make sense at all for countries like Ethiopia or Greece or Turkey to import uh, uh, electricity produced from solar power in the Gulf. Yeah, they can as well produce it uh, on the spot. So I think these are the challenges Gulf countries need to face. Their, oil, their food import dependence will remain. They need to look uh, uh, where will, are the exportable surpluses of the future and from where is the foreign exchange coming with which they are paying for these food imports. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much. I, I see your hand, Mark. I, I will I will tie, we actually have on this point uh, about the fact that food, food will continue to be largely imported. Um, it, it actually ties to one of the questions from the audience. Uh, the audience, uh, so we have someone asking, can the speakers comment about the efficiency of growing food in arid climate like the Arabian Peninsula? isn't it more efficient to just import food and guarantee a solid supply chain? And so on, on this point, and uh, I guess uh, many of you will, will want to comment, I, I also wanted to, to put another question with that one, which is, uh, do you deem it possible that the Gulf countries could become leaders in innovative solutions to tackle food security issues? including if it doesn't mean that it's just applied for their country, but that they could lead the way for other countries that suffer from arid climate, uh, possibly in Africa, for instance. So not just looking at how these new technologies and new solutions contribute to tackling their specific issues, but also how they can actually uh, become an example uh, for other countries. Um, so that, that was... Um, a mix of questions that I wanted to put out there. So I see Mark, you have your hand up. I'll go to you and then uh, back to Eckert and Tarifa. Um, I mean, uh, Eckert's right in that most of the food will have to be imported and that would be forever the case because you need water. And, uh, but I think to just to call it food um, is, is oversimplifying it. And I think we should really have different segments in the food sector. So for the staples, clearly, it's completely right uh, but that's not a huge amount of money you bring in 20 million tons of wheat it's four billion dollars or something that scale of, of cost is not a huge cost but if we look at things segments like the fresh fruit and vegetables the fish i think you we do have a very good chance of making a very good impact on those and those that those are the types of food products which are harder to move then they're, they're much higher value we've got a much greater chance of it being economically, it making economic and environmental sense to produce things locally. So yeah, some things are much more sensible economically and environmentally to be importing. But fortunately, those are the things which are, are cheap and easy to store, easy to move around. So you can build your buffers uh, against shocks out there in the rest of the world, at least to a, you know, to a fairly significant extent. So that was just a quick question. There's food and there's food. So I think it's informative to consider different segments of the food sector. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Eckert, do you want to answer the, the question? I fully agree, Mark. That's it. <laughs>
Oh, um, so I was talking about the, the previous questions about um, um, do, do you deem it possible that not, not just to tackle their own, uh, their own food security, but that the Gulf countries could continue, uh, continue implementing those uh, new technologies and innovative solutions that could become useful for other countries, not, not just their own challenges? Well, yeah. I mean, they have a very active development agenda in, 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 in some countries. Uh, yeah. Why not, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, these, these technological solutions, they can be uh, an add-on in some countries. And in some countries, they can uh, uh, possibly have a, have a even more positive impact than in the Gulf region where aquifers are so overused yeah, that even with the most efficient use, yeah, they're... they're, they're, they're some caveats apply. So um, there are certainly a, a case to be made to uh, include that, for example, in the work of the Gulf development funds in this region and in their collaborative work with other development institutions. Actually, Thank just you. very quickly, one date. This is an iconic crop in this region, massive production. One date as a water footprint requires 50 liters for its production, <laughs> a single date. Yeah. This is a lot and of water. On the, on, the, on the political level, one might add now with these Abraham Accords and the normalization of relations with Israel, Israel has a very long history of, of technology development in that field. Yeah, So there might be some uh, uh, room for cooperation. Having said that, right, I want to really point out to this issue of the so-called rebound effects or Jevons paradox that if you use these efficiency gains to increase production, you will not reduce your water consumption. Has happened in Morocco, has happened in Israel. So there is really an issue, right? Uh, there is not only so much water. Uh, and also the drip irrigation just maximizes the water that the, the plant is absorbing, right? While this old trickle down of water back into the aquifer that you had with flood irrigation is not occurring anymore. So these effects also need to be uh, studies and take, taken into consideration. So uh, these technological solutions are all nice to have, but they are not the silver bullet. Thank you, Akhet. Uh, Tarifa, you've been patient. I'll go to you. Um, well, I just wanted to comment, like so far, ICPA has uh, uh, implemented research for development activities in, in around 40 countries in Central Asia, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, South Caucasus, and Sub-Sahara Africa. So the work for development in different countries in agriculture is already happening, whether through the small scale irrigation or new crops resilient to soil tolerant. I gave the example earlier of the quinoa as well and our work in Morocco and, and Egypt and, and Jordan as well and other crops. So we are, some of the solutions are being tested, researched and um, uh, tested in the UAE. However, it, it got replicated uh, uh, in other countries. We actually, to stay uh, with you, Tarifa, there is a question from the audience uh, about the UAE. Uh, so I'm going to read the question. For almost a year, we have all been under the influence of the pandemic. What are the steps taken by the UAE in practice? It has recorded, uh, recorded on a practical level some increase in local production in the agricultural sector and in fish farming. Have any projects started so far? If you could... Uh, Tell us a little yeah. bit more about the, the projects. Yes, well, um, th this is, I mean, since the start of the pandemic, I believe the UAE has taken a very steady steps toward the um, uh, uh, food security, food and, and water security. And this, is, was, this was part of the um, national strategy of food security led by the minister of food security in the country and supported by the government. So we did have a real clarity and I would say um, involvement from the leaders of the UAE to ensure that there is uh, a pathway and there is really uh, a way forward for it. So a number of uh, projects has been done, which is again, we've done a number of initiatives, which is support the, uh, the local farmers, uh, where we started trying to um, uh, promoting, uh, promote for local products uh, in the UAE as well as we found the, um, uh, what is it called? The uh, um, market uh, contract, like we had access for those uh, farmers in the um, 
popular and big stores in the UAE, so it becomes something uh, promoted well uh, for uh, the general public, as well as the uh, general campaign in terms of not to waste, uh, what to eat, what are the alternatives. Uh, again, waste is one of the challenges, uh, uh, big challenges here in the UAE. So raising awareness about not to waste and ensure that uh, food is in a place. Uh, home uh, grown product as well. Uh, we did have a number of collaboration uh, with the private sector to provide um, uh, locals with um, uh, with a greenhouse, a small uh, scale greenhouse to keep at home and to try to grow some of their uh, some of the vegetable and fruits for the self sufficiency as well. So that was has gone and make it uh, very much uh, popular uh, for them. And beside that, uh, we did, I think we did manage to have uh, through the uh, alliances with a number of countries to ensure that the, uh, the, the supply chain not to get hugely interrupted. We honestly didn't feel it here. And the uh, local farmer has had uh, a great uh, input to the market through the products they have uh, produced here. Thank you so much. And I find it uh, extremely important to, to mention uh, the, the alliances and cooperation possible. It's, we, we've, uh, we've heard uh, through, through, different, uh, th through different speakers uh, the importance and the, the promises in, of cooperation. I thought uh, the point, uh, Eckert's point also on the impact, uh, the possible impact in terms of cooperation around those type of technologies uh, brought about by the Abraham Accord is def definitely something that will be important to look at um, because we end. Um, yeah, so we also have one last question from the audience um, for Mark and others um, saying, uh, talking about the, the oil and gas prices uh, that are low and petrodollars are not yielding prices to support export and if instead that energy molecule is put to better use in solving water supply issues. Uh, is there a price point at which all of this makes economic sense, or do you think innovation alone can get us get us there? No, no, no. I mean, we, we've got to pay the real price for water. I mean, say we've got a bag of tomatoes that used to cost three fifty liters of water. It's now twenty liters of water. What's twenty liters of water cost? Twenty cents, something like that. If we're paying the real price for the water at a dollar a cubic meter. Um, and that's, uh, that is like a price where you can still make business. So I think with Eckhart, it's not necessarily reducing the water that we need to do. It's getting more crop for the drops of water that we are using. And um, if it uses more water, but we're producing a lot more food, then if it's making economic sense and we're paying the real price for the water, then, then that's, I think that's, that's good. Um, yeah. But, but you're using water unsustainably. You cannot consume that amount of water that you consume right now in the Gulf uh, in the long run, not to, even in the middle run, you cannot consume it. Yes. But, but, but for high value crops that are um, using small volumes of water, um, and by high value, I mean f fresh fruit and vegetables, for example, you can use desalinized water economically if you're down at that type of um, efficiency of water use. Aren't you? Yes, Aisha, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not going to comment specifically on the food uh, security issue uh, because I'm not specialized in that area. But I think uh, one approach that I can relate to and I can mention here is, you know, uh, so Saudi Arabia has, uh, you know, uh, uh, suggested to use the circular carbon economy as an approach which also aims to make value of the hydrocarbon uh, in a way that the use of the hydrocarbon doesn't uh, uh, emit carbon emissions in the atmospheres. And to do so, uh, this approach actually uh, uh, encourage the use of all of the options that uh, eliminate uh, the carbon emissions. There are four R's for this approach is the reuse, the reduce, uh, the remove, and the re reduce. I don't know if I mentioned it, but again, it, it, the idea behind it is, is to use whatever uh, the, the options that are available, be it renewable energy technology, energy efficiency, uh, 
carbon capture and storage uh, or utilization, uh, as well as forestation. Uh, 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 so um, I just wanted to mention that uh, this relevant approach. Thank you so much. Um, we are we are about out of time, so we're going to wrap this up. But I would like to thank the four of you again for an excellent discussion. Uh, I feel very blessed to have been here with all of you today. And um, I'm grateful that I got to moderate such eloquent speakers. Um, if you have parting words, uh, feel free to, to jump in. And uh, otherwise, thank you again for an excellent discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to add my thanks to uh, to uh, everyone, uh, wonderful speakers and a great uh, a moderator with uh, Emma at the helm. Uh, and uh, with this session, uh, we conclude uh, this fifth annual UE Security Forum and it's a virtual format this time. Uh, I hope uh, uh, we, we do stay in touch and we are connect again this, uh, next year. Uh, hopefully it'll be again an in-person event. Uh, this, this event usually takes place uh, in Abu Dhabi on an annual basis. Uh, so we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person next year. Uh, please stay safe and have happy holidays to those of you celebrating. <laughs>